Brother Dub has had the slot in closing out the lectureship for some years. He filled in already for an earlier time. And we're grateful that he did that, and we're happy to have him now with us. I'll not try to go back through a lot of the details. Most of you know him. He's been ex The best way to put it, he's been extremely active and faithful in the various and sundry works in the kingdom of the Lord. And for that, we are indeed grateful. He writes some tremendous articles. His scripture cash web page if you go there you can find about everything addressed as far as religious biblical topics and i hope that uh, you'll go there and look at some of his material we use him a, a lot in the contending for the faith and we're looking forward to many other good things from brother dub and our prayers are always with him we want him to come and bring this last lesson of this year's lectureship on the topic of Christ confronted error about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Brother Dub, come speak to us, please. One of the highlights of my year every year is coming to spring. I never take it for granted, but uh, always. Uh, I'm surprised each year when I get an invitation back and always appreciative of uh, getting those invitations. Spring Church has a very, uh, very warm place in my heart, big place in it. Uh, you've been so supportive of the work I've tried to do for a number of years now and um, I do not have enough words to express uh, fully my gratitude. And so many of you have been very supportive of uh, me during these last two months. And I thank you for that. The elders here are uh, special men. And they've kept this uh, part of the ship of Zion on course for a number of years now and pray that they'll continue to do so and have every confidence that they will not go squirrely. <laughs> And, of course, Brother David Brown's a dear friend of many years and uh, have great respect and appreciation for him and Jody as well. I want to invite you to our gospel meeting at North Point beginning March 31st, Lord willing. If you have not checked your calendar, you'll see that is designated as Easter Sunday. But uh, we're not going to have any special observance except that Danny's going to be specially preaching the gospel. And that will go through Wednesday night, April 3rd. And we really look forward to that. I don't know what happened. Uh, I guess David and Buddy flipped a coin and David lost. Buddy usually introduces me. But uh, it's all right for David to introduce me. In fact, I'm kind of glad he did, because the introduction was much shorter that way. <laughs> Buddy and Burnell have been uh, uh, hosts to me, and they were to Levon for many, many years. And I deeply appreciate their wonderful hospitality. I've wondered about it a little bit this year. Uh, Buddy uh, <coughs> sort of dropped a hint, I guess, about, oh, yesterday morning or so, he, uh, we're talking about grandchildren, they're visiting, and he said, you know, you look forward to seeing the headlights, and then you start wishing to see the taillights, and I uh, thought maybe he had something in mind besides just grandchildren. <laughs> really, the first hint I had was, though, I, I walked into the bedroom that almost has my name on it, and there were no curtains in the room this year. So we had no drapes of wrath. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> but the real problem started with the water heater. I took a shower Wednesday afternoon, and, and I could tell the 
water heater was not functioning properly because uh, it got cool before I finished. And uh, Lester came in and uh, he stayed there too and, and uh, I talked to Lester a little bit about it on the way home Wednesday night and I said you may uh, find not enough hot water in the morning. And so we uh, sort of flipped a coin verbally and uh, about who would take a shower first and I said well why don't you go ahead so he did Thursday morning and sure enough there wasn't much hot water left at all this time he got through showering so we talked about it some more and I decided well proper thing to do would be to say something to Buddy about it he probably didn't know because he never takes a shower in that bathroom you know <laughs> <laughs> I was under the mistaken impression that they had one water heater for our bathroom and another water heater for their bathroom but I was wrong so uh, um, I made the mistake of saying something about the water heater. Well, Buddy decided he needed to fix it, and I'm sorry I said anything about it. Uh, now Lester then got in on it with Buddy, apparently, because he wanted me to take the first shower the next morning. And he claimed that his alarm clock was not waking him up, and so I needed to get up first and take my shower so I could wake him up. So I got up and took my shower the next morning, and there was no hot water. It didn't start off lukewarm that time. And so I felt compelled to say something to Buddy about it again, and I wish I hadn't. <laughs> he worked on it some more. Found out he had turned the breaker off and left it off. <laughs> and again, I'm sorry I said anything about it, because it got worse. I think he put ice in it the next time. <laughs> We've learned to take very short showers at the Roth House. <laughs> and I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to cripple along on that old run-down, beat-up, worn-out water heater until they can get in their new house. <laughs> and I don't blame them for that. Well, we have had a good time at the Ross, as we always do, and enjoyed uh, Burnell's cooking so much, and a little bit of uh, Buddy's as well. I will not begin to have time to cover all the material I have in the book on this subject, and so I urge you to read that material. <clears throat> I want to just begin by observing what we all know, that Jesus came on a great mission of peace to this world, Peace between himself and mankind, or between deity and mankind, which he summarized in his statement to Zacchaeus, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. He also came on a mission that would bring peace between human beings if they would but follow his word. And I think this is the significance of the message of the angelic host that appeared at his birth outside of Bethlehem, peace on earth, goodwill among men. But if men think that he came only on a mission of peace, they have either quit reading too soon in the sacred text or they do not believe what the sacred text actually says. Besides his mission of peace, he came with a mission of unrest and discomfort and even division. Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 51 says he came to cast fire upon the earth and division rather than peace. And in his uh, commission to the apostles as he first sent them out, recorded in Matthew chapter 10, though they were to preach the soon-to-come kingdom and were to spread peace as they preach that message, he also cautioned them, verse 34, think not that I came to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now his statement here does not contradict the fact that he was a peace bringer and peace maker. What he means is, think not that I came only to send peace upon the earth but I also came to send a sword or to cause division. He knew that his message would bring peace where men accepted it, but that it would bring division and disruption among men, among those who would reject it. 
The fact that he did not run from truth-stirred conflict does not contradict the fact that he came to bring peace. Nor does it mean <clears throat> that he sought conflict as an end within itself. It was the natural result of his determination to stand at all costs for that which was truth and that which was right. So he confronted error as a matter of duty in defense rather than in sacrifice of principle, truth, and righteousness. In contrast with that, Many among the saints today, including elders and preachers, think that the worst sin that one can commit is to get involved in a religious dispute with anybody. We see the same thing in our government and its policies, and they are adversely affecting our nation even. Jesus confronted the Pharisees <clears throat> on the issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage among other subjects of confrontation with them. He first issued some uh, teaching on this subject in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32, Matthew records that the Lord said, But I say unto you that everyone that putteth away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, maketh her an adulteress, and whosoever shall marry her when she is put away, committeth adultery. Now, it may be that this statement sparked the later question that the Pharisees would bring to Jesus in Matthew 19, as recorded in verse 3. Matthew says, they approached Jesus, trying him and saying, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? It is certain that they were not sincerely seeking truth, but they apparently sought to discredit the Lord before the multitudes by arraying his doctrine against that of Moses. They also sought to justify their own practice, seems completely obvious. Well, their devious question resulted in Jesus' reproof and rebuke of the Pharisees because of this erroneous view concerning marriage and putting away our divorce. Now the guile-laden question of the Pharisees in Matthew 19.3 indicates their liberal attitude toward divorce and remarriage, implying that they believed it was lawful, that is permissible by the law of God for a man to put away his wife for any cause. Now we're the Lord on earth today this question would be most appropriate, would it not? Because <clears throat> the question reflects the prevalent view in our nation and perhaps in all of the world on this subject, namely that divorce and remarriage are acceptable and permissible on almost any ground or sometimes practically none at all. It's a little, bre a little better among some of our brethren. Over the past few decades, Perhaps a dozen or more loopholes have been invented to circumvent the teaching of the Lord in this larger passage in Matthew chapter 19, or chapter 9, chapter 19 it is. We need to wish them, him here in person. We need not to wish him here in person if we would like to hear what he has to say on the subject. Because what he says in this passage is exactly what he would say were he on earth among us today. I want to first analyze Jesus' answer to the Pharisees and the question that they have trying or tempting him. When they say, is it lawful, he basically replies to them, no, it is not lawful. He does not say it in those words, but his answer surely implicates that negative answer. In Matthew 22 and verse 29, after the Sadducees had set before him the hypothetical uh, situation with the seven successive husbands of the one woman, the Lord's initial response to them was, ye do err not knowing the scriptures. Similarly, 
His response to the Pharisees' question is a rebuke of their ignorance. Verse 4 of Matthew 19, have you not read? As if to say, the very idea, you quote Moses to me, have you not read what Moses actually recorded earlier about this subject of marriage and divorce and so forth? Had they read and correctly applied what God had said about the matter, when he created the first man and woman and brought them together, they would have known better than to ask their question. Casual divorce amounts to rejection of God's law on several grounds, and I want to explore those briefly now. Casual divorce violates God's law because it rejects the following things. Number one, the authority of the creator of man, woman, and marriage from the beginning. And the Lord took the Pharisees all the way back to Genesis 1, 27 in his response in verse 4 of Matthew 19. It rejects God's explicit law intended to govern marriage permanently. That law, a man, singular, shall cleave to his wife, singular, and the two, only the two, a man and a woman, shall become one flesh, singular verse 5 of Matthew 19, and gleaned from Genesis 2 and verse 24. It rejects the fact that two are joined, are made one, not merely by men or by a man and a woman involved, but by God. Verse 6, what therefore God hath joined together. It rejects in the fourth place the fact that no man has any right to tamper with the divine arrangement for marriage, nor can any man undo a God-made marriage by mere human direction or declaration. Verse 6. Casual divorce rejects the fact that this is not a new teaching, not a new interpretation of an old teaching, but it has been God's law from the beginning. Verses 4 and 8. It rejects the fact that divorce on various grounds came in by human reasoning and weakness. Verses 3, 7, and 8 of Matthew 19. It rejects the fact that God allows one to divorce one's scriptural mate only because of fornication by that mate. Verse 9, the heart of the passage. And finally... It rejects the fact that divorce and remarriage for any but the one stipulated exception of fornication makes one an adulterer. Verse 9. So Jesus left no doubt in the minds of these devious Pharisees, nor should there be any doubt in the minds of anyone today who fairly reads what his response to them was. The Pharisees' strategy was to place Jesus in conflict with Moses, or at least with one of the popular rabbinical interpreters of Moses, thereby discrediting him with the multitude, verses 7 and 8. The Pharisees and Sadducees were exceedingly jealous of Jesus and the vast multitudes of people he was attracting. They sought every possible way to discredit him before them. Paraphrase, they responded to him, You say divorce is unlawful, but Moses commanded it. Whom should we follow? After identifying human rebellion or the hardness of heart as the basis of Moses' concession to which they referred from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, Jesus immediately took his stand upon God's law from the beginning, although it meant the following things. Number one, it meant correcting Moses, the most revered by the Jews of all their prophets and teachers. It was not God's law from the beginning that a man should be uh, able to give his wife a bill of divorcement, even as Moses allowed in Deuteronomy 24. This was allowed to come in as a concession afterward. So Christ is correcting that. Second, it meant directly condemning the Jews for their hardness of heart both in the days of Moses and every generation of Jews down to the time of our Lord. 
It meant contradicting the moral compromise of his time and particularly of the Pharisees who had asked him this question. It meant calling upon his hearers to change their thinking and practice completely. The Lord did not hesitate to call upon that. It meant arraying his authority against the Jewish judicial and legal authorities of the day, namely the Sanhedrin court. It meant contradicting the religious leaders of his time, including these very Pharisees. Now, brethren, when we stand uncompromisingly, with the Lord on what he taught in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9, we find ourselves in almost the identical relationship toward com uh, comparable contemporaries, including a host of our own brethren. Now let's look at the exception that Jesus uh, gives for the general rule concerning putting away and remarriage. It's in verse 9, of course. The exception stated in verse 9 involves two elements. Number one, it involves the conditional right to divorce and remarry. And number two, it involves the only scriptural condition upon which God allows divorce and remarriage. In their question, their question that is, may I divorce my wife and marry another on any pretext? Now, they did not include the marry another, but you can just about bet that that was part of their question. May I put away my wife for any cause? Why would you put her away for any cause? Well, the most of the time, to marry another. So, in their question, the Pharisees apparently had selfish excuses in mind for divorce and remarriage. This spirit, of course, firmly prevails in our nation and has done so for decades now. Until about 50 years ago, divorce was almost universally stigmatized. And it was difficult to obtain one apart from the stated cause of adultery. Then the social engineers went to work. And then the legislators followed their lead in the early 1960s by liberalizing divorce laws. These have steadily discouraged lifelong marriage commitment and have had a great deal to do with the breakdown of the home and family in our nation. No-fault divorce is now almost universal. The so-called sexual revolution of the late 1960s and the women's liberation movement of the 1970s strongly contributed to abandonment of and negativism toward the biblical concept of marriage and the home. These developments so cheapened marriage that millions of couples have adopted long-standing Hollywood morals and now shamelessly cohabit and breed no more bothering to marry than brute beasts. For two or three generations, the view has been prevalent that marriage is a meaningless throwaway contract. By contrast, Jesus gives the only divinely authorized exception to lifetime marriage, fornication in one's spouse. Fornication translates the Greek word pornea, the umbrella Greek term for every form of sexual deviancy or impurity, including harlotry, homosexuality, both male and female, bestiality, and adultery. Divorcing one's mate for such behavior would most likely be for a basically unselfish reason. Not in order to take up with a new mate, but to protect one's own person and home from the corrupting influence of immorality. The Lord does not command divorce or remarriage in such cases, but he allows both divorce and remarriage of the innocent mate or his words in this passage are meaningless. Now there have been numerous modern attempts to alter the force or circumvent the force of Jesus' words and Jesus' doctrine in this passage. As mentioned earlier, liberals have by numerous crafty theories sought to circumvent the plain statement of Jesus on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. 
I do not think this is a difficult passage to understand if one is willing to take what the Lord says about it. His teaching in this passage, either explicitly or implicitly, confronts all such false teachers and their errors. And we now turn our attention to a brief review of just a few of these subterfuges. One of these contrivances seeks to limit the application of Jesus' doctrine only to Christians. Some assert that since Jesus' words immediately, that is in the context of Matthew 19, applied only to the Jews, God's covenant people then, that after the cross they apply only to Christians, God's covenant people since the cross. The purpose of this quibble is to allow men and women to divorce and remarry without limit before they become Christians. And then to say whatever one you're with when you become a Christian is the one you get to keep. However, Jesus based his dogma on God's law governing marriage from the beginning of man's existence. Verse 4 of Matthew 19 and going back to Genesis 1:27, And verse 5 of Matthew 19 going back to Genesis 2 and verse 24. He emphasized deity's all time universal fundamental principle for marriage. Here it is. One man, one woman joined by the one God to become one flesh for life. Not one man joined to one man or one woman joined to one woman or a man or a woman joined to a goat. Obviously, God's statements in Genesis 1 and 2 predated by many centuries the distinction he later made between Jew and Gentile by giving his covenant law through Moses. Jesus also indicated the universality of his teaching by applying it to whosoever, Matthew 19, verse 9. Whosoever shall put away his wife, etc. There is no justification for limiting whosoever in this passage unless or to what extent the Lord himself might limit it, which incidentally he does in verse 12. Any such limitation must be restricted solely to that which he sets forth. In his complimentary statement, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Jesus used whosoever twice, and everyone wants to emphasize that this applies to everybody. Now, another forceful indication of the universality of Jesus' marriage doctrine in the context deserves more emphasis, in my opinion, than it has received. The disciples, in response to Jesus' statement in Matthew 19, 9, obviously understood the import of Jesus' words to be very strict, and they mildly complained at their perceived strictness. Verse 10, if this is the case, Lord, none of us better marry, was basically their response. The Lord responded, not all men can receive this saying, but they to whom it is given, verse 11. In other words, the whosoever of verse 9 does have exceptions, which he proceeded to identify. Now, what or who are the exceptions? The only ones Jesus excludes are eunuchs, those unable even to consummate a marriage, whether natural born, he says, whether man-made, or whether self-made for the kingdom's sake. Verse 12, note who are not accepted not Gentiles before the cross are non-Christians since the cross, that is, non-covenant people. The Lord's teaching in this passage therefore applies to all others except those who cannot even consummate a marriage, who are eunuchs. Others would mitigate the force of Jesus' words by defining adultery, the word adultery, to mean merely repudiating the marriage contract instead of defining it as sexual unfaithfulness to one's scriptural mate. They argue that one thereby can abandon one's mate upon any selfish pretext and repent, quote and unquote, of so doing by merely saying, I'm sorry for breaking up our marriage, 
I'm sorry, for breaking the covenant, in other words. Obviously, by this stratagem, one is then free to marry another, just as obviously this is the motive behind such an absurdity. Those who introduced this monstrosity should have been laughed to scorn. Instead, some have so feverishly sought some detour around the Lord's teaching that they've adopted it, seriously argued it even in debate, and split congregations over it. Admittedly, inspired writers used adultery in a figurative term. The apostles characterized Israel's idolatry and apostasy as spiritual adultery, or the prophets did. But even in doing so, they employed graphic descriptions of the literal, physical meaning of the term. And we've cited prophetic instances in the chapter. Similarly, James uses adulteresses figuratively to describe Christians who had been unfaithful to their spiritual husband by their friendship with the world, James 4 and verse 4. The Greek authorities universally attest that one cannot define the word adultery or the act of adultery in connection with a literal marriage apart from unlawful sexual intercourse, however. While adultery demonstrates the cause for breaking the marriage vow, the immoral act itself constitutes the cause. Another common ploy is the assertion that adultery in an unscriptural marriage is only a one-time act rather than a continuing behavior or state of being. Advocates then argue that couples in an unscriptural marriage are not thereafter living in adultery. They allege that since only the first act of copulation is a forbidden, in a forbidden marriage constitutes adultery, they can thereafter continue in the marital unions as long as they repent, quote and unquote again, that is, say they are sorry for that initial act. This outlandish position reveals the desperation of some to mitigate the force of Jesus' teaching. Its advocates conveniently reserve this idea of non-continuous sin for adultery alone, it seems. First note that committeth adultery, twice stated in Jesus' statement, is a present tense form that conveys the idea of continuous or linear action with the force of keeps on committing adultery. The adultery of Matthew 19.9 is thus a condition a way of life in which one is living. It is a forbidden union polluted by adultery. The only way to repent of an adulterous union is to sever it and to cease the intimacy it involves. Further, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7 mentions fornication, which includes adultery and other sins, and then says that the Colossians had formerly walked and lived in these things. Confer 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 on this point as well. The Bible thus speaks of living in adultery. But the separation of unscripturally marriage partners is intractable, some argue. However, in light of Jesus' teaching and of the eternal consequences of approaching the judgment as an adulterer, Living in or remaining in an adulterous, unscriptural marriage is the untra uh, intractable course. The earliest that I have been able to find that someone took the position that the guilty party in a marriage where fornication had uh, been involved has the right to remarry is the year 1950. It was picked up and popularized somewhat in the 1970s. In our uh, first annual Denton Lectures, 1982, for one of our discussion forums, in which we invited a false teacher to come in and, and give his false teaching and then had it answered by some faithful brother, we invited Brother Lewis Hale, who had written a book on the subject, to come and present his view. What he affirmed was the following. 
The guilty party in a divorce, that is the fornicator, has the scriptural right to remarry, quote and unquote. Well, champions of this contention fail to recognize the significance of Matthew 19, 6. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, the brethren who argue that the guilty party has the equal right to remarry assert that if the marriage is dissolved for one mate, the innocent mate, then it must be dissolved for the guilty mate. And if the innocent mate has the right to remarry, then the guilty mate also has the right to remarry. But Jesus said, what God hath joined together. And here is what they fail to see. Every scriptural marriage does not involve merely a man and a woman. It involves three persons. It involves the man, it involves the woman, the husband, the wife, but it also involves God and his law. While the fornicator is indeed no longer bound to the mate who puts him away, he's nonetheless still bound to God who joined them together into his law concerning divorce and remarriage. Jesus' statement in Matthew 19, 9 specifies to whom he grants the right to remarry, namely the innocent spouse. Now, if the guilty party has the same scriptural right to remarry as the innocent one does, fornication indeed is a sin that one can commit to one's own pleasure and indulgence. Again, if he has the right or she has the right to remarry, why did the Lord even bother to discuss this matter? His words actually imply a strong prohibition of remarriage for the fornicating spouse. The well-known Greek scholar A.T. Robertson, though not one of us, commenting on Matthew 19.9 made this very point. Jesus, by implication, as in Matthew 5.31, does allow remarriage of the innocent party, but not the guilty one, unquote. Now, the last of the errors that I want to mention this afternoon has come from a cadre of brethren who've become rather vocal over the past few years, insisting that God honors and is bound by the civil courts in matters of marriage and divorce. Although the Lord stated that men did or do not have the ability to sunder a man and woman whom he has joined in marriage, Matthew 19, 6, these brethren assert by implication that man can and indeed do so. The consequence of their contention is to deny an innocent spouse the scriptural right to remarry in spite of the fact that his or her spouse has committed fornication or adultery. Now, we've talked some about hypothetical situations during this week and some of the lectures. I want to set forth another one this afternoon. And I think it's not too uncommon a situation. I believe it's realistic, in fact, but it brings the consequence of this position into focus. Joe divorces Jane because he finds Mary more attractive. No fornication involved at this juncture. The civil divorce decree says that the marriage no longer exists, freeing Joe to legally marry Mary. Is Joe scripturally free to marry Mary? Scripturally now, already legally, it's been accomplished. In Matthew 19, 9, the Lord said by implication that Joe and Jane are still married, although the civil law of divorce says that they are not. Would Joe's marriage to Mary be an adulterous marriage or a divinely sanctioned one? If Joe and Jane were not still bound to one another by God's marriage law, in spite of the civil divorce decree, why would Joe's marriage to Mary constitute adultery? Adultery against Jane, in fact, whom he divorced without scriptural cause. As Mark 10 verse 11 says, he maketh her an adulteress. Here we have a marriage which men say is legal, but which God say is forbidden because it constitutes adultery. So the foregoing case leads to emphasize the one exception besides death that Jesus gave 
that can break the absolute permanency of a God-ordained marriage. That one exception is fornication on the part of one's mate. Now let's revisit the case of Joe, Jane, and Mary. Joe sought and obtained a civil law divorce from Jane with no fornication by either Joe or Jane. At this point, on the basis of Matthew 19, 9 related verses, neither of them can remarry with God's approval, for to do so would be to commit adultery. This is so because by divine law they are still married or bound to one another in spite of the civil divorce. Their only scriptural marriage option in the present circumstance is reconciliation. 1 Corinthians 7, 11. In other words, in the eyes of God, they are just separated. They are not divorced. Joe, or Jane, revisited and resisted the divorce and sought to prevent it. She did not want this to take place. She sought reconciliation to Joe, but he would have none of it. Another way of looking at it is to say that legally the marriage of Joe and Jane has been dissolved, but scripturally, in God's eyes, and that's a perfectly good and scriptural statement, by the way, it is still intact because neither of them has committed fornication. As far as God is concerned, the divorce decree involving Joe and Jane is mo no more than a blank piece of paper. They are merely separated from each other, but still bound to each other as far as God is concerned. Remember, however, that Joe was already smitten with Mary before the divorce. The reason he divorced Jane. Joe now legally marries Mary, and they both thereby become fornicators or adulterers, regardless of her eligibility to be married, as they engage in sexual unions. As with their divorce, this marriage, while legal, is merely a marriage on paper. It is not a marriage at all according to God's law, as with Herod, Antipas, and Herodias. And you remember what John said to Herod, you have no right to her. Joe and Mary are actually engaging in fornication, although the relationship is authorized by civil law. Now, Jane did nothing to bring about the divorce. As already noticed, she sought to prevent the divorce. She sought reconciliation with Joe and would have forgiven him, but he refused. By marrying Mary, Joe committed fornication, the very ground upon which Jesus said an innocent spouse may be free from the original marriage and free to marry again. Of course, fornication itself does not dissolve a marriage, but it gives the offended party the right to resolve, dissolve uh, the marriage and remarry. But Jane is an innocent victim, the very one to whom the Lord's statement in Matthew 19, 9 gives the right to remarry. However, she cannot now obtain a civil law divorce on her initiative, for legally, Joe has already done that. The civil authorities no longer recognize Joe as still being her husband, although God still does. However, as already seen, the legal divorce Joe obtained is meaningless because or before God. I submit, therefore, that Matthew 19, 9 gives Jane the moral and scriptural right to honor or accept, because of Joe's fornication, the divorce he early obtained. The marriage is thus scripturally ended giving Jane the scriptural right to remarry if she chooses. One grossly errs now to label what I've described on Jane's part as the waiting game in which both parties wait to see which one will be the first to commit fornication, thus technically giving the other the right to remarry. Obviously no such thing occurred in this case. That, number one, Jane did not obtain a civil law divorce from Joe. Number two, neither Joe nor Jane had committed fornication at the time of the civil law divorce was granted. Number three, the divorce papers did not specify fornication as the cause for the divorce. Or number four, Joe's fornication did not occur until after the meaningless, to God, paper 
divorce was granted are all irrelevant. For the Lord honored neither Joe's and Jane's legal divorce, nor Joe's and Mary's legal marriage. What did take place, as far as the Lord was concerned, in the mind of God, the knowledge that Joe had committed fornication against his wife, Jane, giving Jane the right to remarry. Now, to say that Jane does not have the right to remarry is to exalt human law above divine law. To deprive Jane of the right to remarry represents placing more emphasis on the timing of the act of fornication than on the act itself, which is where the Lord placed the emphasis. Surely this cannot be correct exegesis. Certainly there were several laws that existed that are in harmony with divine laws on marriage, divorce, and, and other subjects, and we must comply with them according to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7 and other passages. However, when the laws of men conflict with God's law, we must obey God rather than men, as Acts 5.29 instructs. Though well-meaning these brethren may be, they are implying that we must obey men rather than God in this matter. Their contention, therefore, is basically one of anti-ism, forbidding that which God allows or binding where God has not bound. Well, we had an excellent lesson uh, previous to this one on the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles as he promised when he returned to the Father. Among other things, Jesus promised that the Spirit would guide them into all the truth, John 16, 13. One of the implications of this promise is that Satan would never be able to invent a false doctrine that had not been anticipated and answered in advance. The very nature of the case, if all the truth was revealed before the last apostle died, then every error that men can ever invent has already been answered. Now, we may not have found all the answers yet, but the answers are there for whatever may come. This implication is as true for errors on marriage, divorce, and remarriage as on any other subject. Although men have invented many strange doctrines on this and other subjects, the Lord through his own words and through the words of the Spirit-inspired men have answered them all. Our Lord did not seek controversy, but brethren, he did not back away from it when the truth and righteousness were at stake. May we never do so. Thank you. Michael, I appreciate you giving him your time. I do feel like that we ought to uh, give Buddy time rebuttal because it's obvious that he thought Buddy was going to introduce him and was prepared to have a reply. So, Buddy, if you'd like to come up here. <laughs> you know, I hate to see brethren fight, but if they are, I don't want to miss it. This is not re really a, a, a fight at all. I, I really can't uh, can't di di dispute what uh, what Dub said. I, I messed up. Uh, can like we all just get along? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the, the the problem is? It's advice for you. Uh, any of you that have hosted any of these preachers in your in your home. Now you know Scripture tells us to confess our faults one to another. Now, now I, I think that means sin. But I mean, if you just mess up a little bit, Kenneth, you know, and you, you do something that's kind of you know, old age set in type things. What, is that what they said about going squirrely? Yeah, going squirrely. <laughs> if you do that, uh, okay. Let me let me set the stage here. I, I worked on that water heater and I forgot to turn the breaker back on. Now. Now, what my mistake was, was fessing up. <laughs> now, I thought maybe I'd get, David, I'd get a little bit of sympathy from an older brother. You know, so, somebody that we kind of look up I to could, as a father figure. I could have told you that was 
<laughs> you just asked. Well, okay, I learned a lesson. And, and the lesson is yours then, too. Remember this. You have the right to remain silent. Because <laughs> I'll assure you that whatever you say can and will be held against you. <laughs> You know, this is one of the, I know the serious business, the study of God's Word. Understanding the truth and refuting error. But this is the camaraderie and fellowship that I don't know anybody else can have, that, but that can come between brothers and sisters in Christ of like precious faith. Yeah, I wouldn't feel comfortable with this kind of thing in a lot of atmospheres. And I'm glad we have that relationship and have cultivated it over the years. I was just wondering, why didn't you have it about 150 degrees and see what they said? <laughs> Although with Lester and uh, Dub, I wondered why they were just awake and alive all day long like that. <laughs> I hope somebody didn't get any other ideas. But, uh, you know, at my home, we host gospel preacher 24 hours a day. <laughs> we are deeply appreciative. And I have to say, as somebody said earlier, with the Spring Church of Christ, we're not without our mistakes and problems. We're human beings. But as it comes to joining together like this and pretty much all hands helping out, uh, and if you're not one of those, uh, you know now you ought to be. <laughs> but it makes a big difference. I, I was thinking, and I used to try to do this, as mentioned different ones, and it's kind of difficult to do that because I always leave somebody out. But for everybody that had something to do with the meal today and the meal every day, and then getting the building in order and keeping it clean and helping Sonia and uh, helping Sonia, helping Sonia, <laughs> because she's there doing all sorts of things. All of those here who help put up the preachers and tolerate the preachers and deal with the preachers. <laughs> we appreciate that very much. And I know that I do speak for all of them. They pretty much said so as far as the preachers and the appreciation of you and allowing a little place for them to stay during this time. We hope you will help us in the spreading of the sale of the book and the, the CDs, DVDs, and signing up for uh, to receive the paper and helping other people know about it now that we've gone free over the internet. And keeping us in your prayers that we can prosper and handle all things according to the authorized Word of God, and be as diligent and zealous as is possible for humans to be in continuing this effort and then in our daily operation for the Lord. Uh, do any of the elders want to make any comments? On behalf of the elders and the congregation, thank you, David. Well, thank, thank you very much. This is the 20th year, and you know they've put up with me through thick and thin. And I've been more thick most of the time than I have thin. And I, I've got to do something about that. Don't you laugh. You've got a lot of room to talk. The only one that's got room to talk is, is uh, this escapee from a Nazi concentration camp, Dub. They couldn't. Well, that's just as good a note to end on as I can think of. Any other? I'm afraid to ask anybody else to come up to do anything. I'm going to ask Brother Ken, if he would, to come lead us in a prayer, and we'll consider these proceedings dismissed following that prayer. Thanks for everything. Keep us in your prayers, and we will for you too.